stalwart teachers like Professor Kumar and uh, Dr. Sharma and everybody is there to teach us. Our our regional greater faculties are also there, and uh, always they have cooperated. And whenever we have changed our debt, still they have cooperated and get out with that time. So it's been a great uh, opportunity for our students because MS practical exam is knocking at the door. So that's a very an interesting and very proper timing we have done and possible because of everyone's involvement. So I think uh, uh, there is a, already we have six, three. So it's better to go live. So you can go live yeah, in the yeah, YouTube. I, I, I then, think, I, I think yeah, you can go then live. Then we'll start with the scientific. And yeah. before that, if you or Avishek can brief the um, timeline of the course today, how the flow of events yeah, will go on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, we start with Professor uh, Sudhir Kumar, sir. So, hip examination from 6 p.m., I think. And then followed by Professor Jayan Sharma from Indore. Uh, the hip uh, thing will go on till probably 7.30. 7.30 to 8 is tentatively a small spine examination protocol by Professor Sudhir Kumar as well. So is having some issues with the presentation. So just a verbal uh, covering of the topic we'll uh, uh, do. And from 8.15 p.m. onwards, our very own Fernando Shamantu sir will take over with the knee examination. So that is the how the day, day will progress. Okay, great. So Professor Kumar, so if you are ready, we can go live and we'll start with you, sir. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Yes, sir. I'm so you, happy sir. to be with you all. It's so a pleasure, I, it sir. has been a short notice to me, and I am not in Delhi at the moment. I am actually yes, sir. Doing. Good evening. Very yes, good sir. evening, Shomio. How are you? Yes, sir. I am fine, sir. Okay. So, by all, uh, all because of my love for West Bengal Orthopedic Association, that I consented. Okay, I will manage it somehow, and it's indeed always a pleasure to be among you all. And uh, uh, especially uh, when I see the younger people, I really get thrilled on it. Uh, well, I think uh, what I'm going to present today is, uh, is basically meant for youngsters who are appearing for examination and, and put forward a checklist for them so that they could remember the points, the way to go, whether uh, they uh, whether they find it positive or negative, whatever it is. So with these uh, hints that you have to examine each and every part in your checklist so that you do not miss. Hence, you raise an objective data. Based on your objective data, and as you have already got a subjective data with you, with a history, then you are going to do a interpretation of that. So the examination of a hip is another important point of view is that this is the case that you are going to get as a long case most of the time these days. Uh, of course, another is spine, but most of the time when you go around, when you find the cross section in the country, um, it's a hip which always comes forward. Uh, so with these words, I think I'll start sharing my uh, screen with you. Uh, just hold a minute, yes. And uh, uh, this is share, uh, this is here, uh, and I share. Is it all right? I'm sharing. Is it is it yes, visible sir. to you all? Yes, sir. All yes, right. sir. Yes, sir. Go to the presentation mode, sir. Go to the presentation right, mode. Okay, slideshow, okay. Right, sure. Okay. Yes, is it all perfect. right? Yes, it's perfect, sir. It's all yes. right, sir. It is okay, absolutely fine. okay, sir. It is uh, audible and visible. Please continue, sir. Fine. So, as I, at the very outset, I said that you have to be very, very, uh, uh, very, very presentable in your examination, and you have to have certain etiquettes when you are examining your patient. Because most of the time you will be given a chit that you examine this patient and examine the hip. So what you do when you go by the bedside of the patient, you, you introduce yourself, 
and say that, hello, my name is so-and-so in the proper language which the, your patient can understand. And then you take a consent from the patient for examination because you must understand that examiner is watching you. He's around, the team is around and they're watching you what you are doing. And also very important for national board student as well as we and the university students as well that we introduce ourselves and take the consent of our patient for examination. So the very at the very outrest, you will have to expose your patient because you have taken a consent, you will have to explain to him. And uh, for examination of the hip, you must expose the part completely right from right from chest downwards. And uh, uh, it's very important that if it is a female patient, you must have a female attendant and a female nurse with you who should be by your side when you are examining a female patient. And you must respect the decency in every mode and have a close environment. You will have to give, you will have to respect the dignity of your patient. That's very important. And a proper exposure of the part of the pelvic region can be done either by using a tea bandage in a, in a young people or giving them a langot or a panties. The best thing that my suggestion would be that you carry at least two free size two panties. That means one for the uh, one for the adults and another for the children. So so that you can gift a new panty to your patient and patient will feel so pleased. So a sequence of examination is important to remember and to have your checklist. That means. If a patient who is walking, who can walk, you start with walking, a standing, a sitting, squatting, cross leg sitting, and then you make them lying down in supine and prone position. If you remember this sequence, you are not going to miss the observations that you make in, these, in your patient. Uh, as you are examining your patient in a standing position, the first thing that you look for is the gait. So whether the gait is an assisted gait or unassisted gait. If it is assisted gait, then you must qualify that whether he uses a stick, crutch, or any orthosis, or whether he is supporting himself on one limb or both the limbs. And uh, basically, you get three types of gait in these patients that are given to you most of the time. You have an antalgic gait, a short limb gait, or a Trendelberg gait. And as well, the stiff hip gait. So you should be able to distinguish in these gates, which is important. And high stepping gait, of course, you do get when you have a neurological involvement of or dropping of the ankle, which is, uh, which is an another aspect with it. So sometimes you can have a complex gait, you know, the limb could be short as well as the limb could be short, as well as it could be lurching on one side. So you must be able to distinguish. And in such cases where you have complex gait, where you have involvement of two components together, then you should be able to explain that this fellow has a short limb gait, as well as he lurches and has a Trendelenburg gait. So with this, we go on to, as the patient is standing, so you look at his posture right from the front, look at the position of the head, the level of the shoulder, 
both the shoulder, whether the shoulder is drooping on one side or they are leveled. What is the level of anterior superior iliac spine? The level of patella and medial malleolus. The bilateral foot, whether it is plantigrade or not, and whether the direction of the patella looks to be rotated on one or the other side and muscle wasting. You see, there are certain points that you must look into standing because quite a number of these points you are going to again look when you are examining your patient in a lying down position because these, these points can change. So you look when you look from front, you must look whether the patient is really bearing both the feet on the ground with equal weight. Go to the lateral profile, which will give you an idea whether the patient has any flexion at the hip or the knee. And compare, always compare from the contralateral side. And whether the fellow has got lumbar lordosis. Go to the back of the patient, and then you can look at the curvature of the spine, whether it is which side is the convexity. So you define the curvature of the spine with the convexity towards the right or towards the left and the symmetry of the gluteal fold. So while this diagram uh, tells you how you look at the various uh, points from the front, from the lateral profile, and uh, from the back. While your patient is standing, you also should be able to do a Trendelenburg test so that you can ascertain the abductor mechanism. As you know that the abductor mechanism, the femoral head forms a fulcrum, while the neck has a liver arm and the abductor muscles have give a power to it. So you must be able to demonstrate whether the Trendelberg test is positive or, or not. So you, but don't comment on it, keep it in your note. Uh, now keep it on your note, and uh, when you have fully examined your patient, then to tell it towards the end. So if you look at this picture, it tells you that in the normal uh, stage, when you are bearing weight on the normal limb, the opposite pelvis gets lifted up. That is what it shows, that it gets lifted up. And while where is it positive? Then when you bear weight on the abnormal limb, then it, the opposite hip goes down. That is what is a positive. So you look at the positive Trendelberg test, look at the gluteal fold and the drooping of the pelvis on the opposite side. After that, for a functional assessment, which is very important in our kind of setup, where most of our patients have floor activities to perform. So ask your patient if you can sit on a chair and then you can look at the level of both ASIS and whether he can squat or whether he can sit cross-legged. Squatting position, you must be able to carefully evaluate it because Many of your patients, you will find, he will say, I can squat, but can he squat in the right position? Many a times they will put their knee on the ground and as the hip doesn't move beyond a certain arc, so the patient are able to still manage and they say, okay, I can sit, I can squat. But in squatting position, you will be able to assess what is the hip uh, restricted in its flexion, and uh, that is most important. And similarly, whether he can sit cross-legged or not. Now, then you ask your patient to lie on a bed in a supine position. 
That means now you have to make sure that when you are making him lie in a supine position, your underlying bed that you have should be absolutely straight. If you have a sagging mattress and you don't have a hard surface, then you may miss certain of the, uh, certain of the uh, deformity. So while inspecting, you should be able to uh, look at the attitude of the limb, whether the fellow has got uh, lumbar lordosis, what is the level of anterior spirit iliac spine, is, are there any swelling, scar, or sinus? Looking at the scar and sinuses is of extremely important because the scars or sinuses which are puckered, they are a telltale story for a, for a pyogenic infection. But if you have a scar which is papery thin, then this gives you an indication that this must have been following a healing of a granulomatous infection. So these scars have a great assessment that you need to make whether the scar is, is a, a surgical scar or otherwise. Level of patella and level of medial malleolus. So the attitude of the limb, look at the lumbar lordosis, which are very important, and the level of these bony points, medial malleolus, and, uh, and the patella. You come on to the palpation. Now, when you are palpating your patient, you should be able to uh, palpate the skin right from the periphery to the center. That is what we call as a temperature gradient. That means the peripheral area is much cooler. And as you go above, as you go proximally, you will find the temperature starts becoming a little warmer and warmer. So that gives you a lot of, uh, lot of uh, indication whether, whether, it is, whether it is a infection of, or, or whether it is any vascular impediment. Now, tenderness at the base of scarpa triangle, you should feel a scarpa triangle, should know where the scarpa triangle is, and then start um, eliciting if there is any tenderness. Level of ASIS, the levels of AS, ASIS should be marked right in a supine position, and you should be able to tell them that I have marked this in a supine position when the patient is lying down. Compare bilateral iliac crest, which is very important. You see, comparing the girth of the iliac crest bilaterally is of great importance because this can give you a lot of uh, information because a problem which has started possibly well in young life can tell you whether the, whether the iliac crest is relatively hyperplastic or it is normal on either side, or if there is an infective process, it might, be, uh, it might appear to be thickened. So this is an important parameter which you need to palpate when you are onto your system of palpation. So compare them from the other side. Vascular sign of Narad, gives you a great information, and then you check for muscle spasm, uh, which is a important aspect for your uh, analysis. Uh, digital, we don't call it digital. I think it's wrongly written here, but what we what, what can do is with the digits, with your digits, you can feel whether the greater tocanter is comparable uh, in its proximal, uh, proximal point. That means by putting your, by palpating the anterior spirit spine and keeping with your thumb and with the middle finger, you palpate the 
uh, you palpate uh, the, uh, what do you call, your tip of the greater trochanter, and then, then you can move it up and down and find out whether they are bilaterally symmetrical or, uh, or there is any discrepancy. It, is, it gives you an idea. Uh, before you start, uh, before you, in fact you start drawing your triangles. Uh, greater to canter, uh, whether it is proximally migrated or uh, it is tender on pressure and what is the surface line. So the very important thing that you need to uh, note down is the girth, anteroposterior broadening, what you call as the anteroposterior girth of the greater trochanter and the surface is regular or irregular. These two aspects are very important and whether it is tender or not. And proximal migration, you can ascertain by various tests. So, uh, so your level of ASIS is important because uh, you have to look at the level of the ASIS by bringing your eye level at the same level as, uh, 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 as the anterior spinalic spine is. That means you have to bend down, you have to sit down and, and then make a parallax with, your, uh, with both the ASIS. So it will give you an idea of any fixed deformities. That means whether it is raised up or it is down, depending on uh, whether it is an adductor deformity or an abduction deformity, or there's no deformity. So if, are there any fixed deformity? This is the time when you should be able to identify if there are any fixed deformities. And uh, the flexion deformity, as you are very well aware about, about it, can be tested by a Thomas, a Thomas test, in which uh, you know that uh, the opposite limb has to be flexed and by keeping your hand under the lumbar, sp lumbar spine. And uh, then you find out whether the affected limb uh, flexes to what degree. And it cannot be stated now. So <clears throat> then the arc of motion, you should be able to describe the arc of motion in your hip joint whether it is active, whether it is assisted, or you have to do a passive movement. So it's important. So whether this is associated with pain, spasm of crepitus. So arc of motion need to be defined in flexion, adduction, and abduction, and rotations. With these uh, qualifying remarks, whether it is active, assisted, passive, or it is assist or it is associated with pain, spasm, or capitus. And then uh, what they call as McFarlane's test, where, where you look for any excess deviation. Important. While you're flexing the affected hip, whether it goes outward, that means there is if there is any excess deviation, it has a definite connotation because uh, any sectorial involvement where the hip becomes, the head becomes spheroidal in shape will show you an axis deviation. So the, you all are aware that the expected range of motion in the hip joint, in flexion, abduction, adduction, medial rotation, lateral rotation, and extensions are very well defined uh, <clears throat> in your normal patient and then this is how you describe the range from zero to such and such or from fixed deformity to such and such mm, uh, degree. And uh, Thomas test, as we all talked about, place your hand uh, uh, in the hollow of lumbar spine, flex the hip and knee of the affected side and, uh, uh, and look to see if hip of the affected side uh, lifts from the bed. Uh, so you must be able to flex the hip and knee of the unaffected side. And then you look to see if hip of the affected side lifts up from the bed or not, and then what angles it forms. 
the flexion of hip and knee of the affected side and note the range of motion. Uh, Thomas test, uh, that's how I think when there is a case-based discussion, this can be discussed. And then uh, we uh, go on to find out if uh, what, what is uh, abduction, how much is the abduction and a deduction, depending on where after you have squared the pelvis and then whether there's a fixed deformity or not. So you got to stabilize the pelvis and hold the ankle with the other hand and then move it. So you have to be gentle while doing it because you, this is all a matter of practice that you should have been doing it. And, but then the right method has to be used to assess these movements. Rotations, both rotations have to be uh, assessed both in flexion and extension at the hip, uh, externally and internally. That means you flex the hip, you, you, in the extension of the hip, what you do is you hold the legs in extended position, both the legs, just above the medial malleolus, and then rotate your hips internally and external and note down what is the range of motion while in flexion you flex the hip to 90 degree or in a deformed hip up to the uh, level when the flexion is uh, available to you in a in a fixed uh, position and then you rotate the hip in the medial and the lateral direction. So that will give you the understanding whether it is the same or different in different positions of the hip joint. And mind it, you got to also do that when the patient is in the prone position. And in a prone position, you do it in flexion of the knee joint. You flex the knee and then demonstrate your internal and external rotation. We'll come on to it when we describe the prone position. So this is how you, you test for rotations on either side. That means always a contralateral uh, hip is available to you, which is normal. Mind it, uh, we are discussing this from the point of understanding that only one hip is involved. And most of the time, we, we tend to give you a one hip involvement. But of course, in practice, you might find both the hips may be involved. But then you have to note down the, the available arc of motion in both the hips whenever you are describing it. And only one hip is involved. And that is how you do and it in most flex position. And... Uh, and of course, this is shown to you when the patient is in prone position, external rotation and internal rotation. So you can demonstrate at the same time. So examiner can ask you to demonstrate these uh, rotations, which is, a, which is a very favorite question most of the time. And uh, you should be able to uh, clearly say that I'm doing it in extended position or a flex position in a supine or in a prone position and I'm comparing it with the contralateral side and I can demonstrate at the same time uh, on either side. And you can also do that while sitting position if examiners insist on you. Can you do it in any position? Yes, sir. We can do it in sitting position, provided your patient is able to sit comfortably. There are certain tests that we have, been, you know, this fibroacetabular impingement uh, has been uh, one of the pop popular um, indictment in the hip uh, uh, pathologies. So, uh, uh, flexion, adduction, and internal rotation test is the one which, which tells us if there's a pain produced at the terminal area or in any in the arc of the motion, 
uh, then it, it gives you a suspicion that there is an anterior impingement. If there is a lateral or a posterior impingement, you do flexion, abduction, and external rotation test. And uh, there are certain tests which you should be aware about, and that is uh, what you call as an Allen's test, in which you can demonstrate which component of the, you can get a, 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 a quick idea of which component uh, of the limb is short, whether it is in the femoral component or the tibial component. And of course, you do know that uh, for ascertaining uh, uh, the supratrochanteric shortening, you will have to resort to certain tests which you should be aware about. And then uh, apparent length measurement. And uh, that is, uh, you do apparent length measurement as the limbs are lying um, in the position. And then you do a true length measurement by, by squaring the pelvis and keeping the limb in identical position. So this is how uh, you draw your branch triangle. So you'll be, you can be asked that, how do you know that, um, is it a supratrochanteric shortening? So you have to compare it from the, from the normal side, from the contralateral side, and you draw your branch triangle by palpating the most prominent part of the greater trochanter. At times there is a broadening or thickening and many a times you are not able to get a very good point uh, of greater trochanter. What you can take is most of the time, the highest level point that you can ascertain on the greater trochanter itself. Now, the other methods for measurements are that you should be aware about Shoemaker's line, the Nelliton's line, the Chinese parallelogram, and Kotari's angle if you want to have a quantitative assessment. <coughs> While in lying down position, in a prone position, look at the gluteal wasting. Is if or there is any abnormal bony mass which is, uh, which is palpable in the gluteal region. You got to distinguish it from the greater trochanter. The mass is whether it is in her askew. Now, uh, but it should remain. Uh, it should remain in your mind that if the question is asked to you, you should be able to reply. They said, "I have not done it. It was possibly not required." So, examiner may ask you, "In which conditions would you like to do it?" He said, "Sir, maybe if there is an old case of central fracture dislocation, or." Um, or there is a pelvic mass, or there is a pelvic abscess. So you should be able to at least give uh, these three points to your examiner. Now, the test for stability is very important. And that is what you say as a telescopy. So you ask your patient. Uh, another test is whether he can actively raise the uh, limb against gravity or not. That is straight leg raising. That is one that gives you an idea whether there is a continuity of the uh, uh, of the stable arc. And uh, the test of telescopy is that you should be able to uh, bring the hip to the 90 degree. And what you do is push and pull. Push and pull. So and now there is a there there, are, there is a, there is a uh, kind of a controversy at time. Should you pull it first and push it then, or do you push it and then pull it? I think it can be done both ways, uh, depending on uh, how the patient is comfortable. And uh, uh, normally it is done in ninety degree of hip flexion and a slight adduction say about 10 degree of adduction to make it little facilitated while this test. And while doing this test, you should be able to hold the supracondylar 
uh, area of the femur with your, if you are doing it on the left hip, you should be able to hold it with the left hand, grip it right from the popliteal fossa posteriorly onto the supracondylar, uh, supracondylar uh, region of the femur and then pull it and push it. There are certain tests we should know which can be done for tightness of the muscle. That is iliotibial band contracture. Of course, it is mostly was in post polio residual palsy, but also if you get a case of cerebral palsy, which is rarely given to you as a long case is not given to you as a cerebral palsy. Alice test is uh, could should be done. You know that in a um, uh, rectus femoris tightness, and it can be done while the patient is lying prone. And tripoid sign is for the hamstring tightness, and uh, this can be done while the patient is lying straight, and then you may make him sit, make your patient sit with the, with the <laughs> limbs absolutely straight, extended, and you find the patient uh, falls back and holds uh, his back uh, onto the couch with the help of his both, uh, both uh, wrist and uh, not able to absolutely 90 degree uh, to keep the leg straight. So Phelps test uh, is basically for uh, grassless tightness. And though it is mentioned here, sometimes it can also be done for sartorius tightness, but basically done for grassless tightness. So to complete the examination of, uh, of uh, hip joint, uh, the spine and both knees must also be examined very carefully. And then you present your clinical findings and summarize them. Because uh, it's important that you should be able to uh, put them in order uh, that this patient has, a, as a, let's say the patient has got an antalgic gait with a fixed flexion deformity. How much is the fixed flexion? Fixed adduction deformity, if it is there, and uh, telescopy is absent, is negative. Now, this is a what, that is how you give your uh, clinical findings. And then you state your diagnosis in order of priority of uh, as per the pathology and differential etiology. That means you must be able to give your diagnosis, a pathological diagnosis, with as a differential diagnosis in order of priority, priority. say whether it is a um, tubercular tuberculosis of the hip joint, whether it is a sequelae of the septic arthritis of the hip joint, or whether it is a secondary osteoarthritis, maybe following a vascular necrosis. So that should be in a, it should be in a order of priority, depending on your objective finding and the impression from the subjective data. With these words, I think I'll close it down and uh, then we can go on to uh, maybe certain questions or maybe a case presentation that would, uh, that would uh, be, uh, that would possibly uh, give us a more uh, insight into the test that we have discussed. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir, for this wonderful presentation. Very, very informative, fantastic. So I think all of us have learned so much. I'm, I think I'm audible. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Sharma, sir, are you here? Yeah, I think I can see. Yeah, I'm here, but I have a sore throat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so for the case-based discussion, I think you can just run through the slides with like, you know, minimal talking if it's not, if it's not a problem with you. Uh, as such, I All was right. Just... You can you can have a sip of water and go slow. Don't <clears throat> don't strain your uh, larynx too much. 
Yes, uh, I'm just wanting to add few points. Recently, I'd been a DNB examiner and an MS examiner both. So because of COVID situations, now they have stopped giving long cases of hip joint as a physical case, but as a virtual case. So a lot of uh, things are asked in Viva Vosi. So this lecture would be of great help because if you <clears throat> have seen this and gone through this, a uh, lot of points are covered. Uh, secondly, I think so. If there is a case, I'll just have a look. Any questions in the meanwhile? I'll just. Uh, Any questions? The house is open to questions. I don't think uh, there are any questions in the audio or the uh, text format. I suppose, do they use the chat box? No. No, no, sir. I, I, I'm just, you know, going through the chat box. So there aren't many questions there. I'll just check YouTube as well. Okay. No, there aren't any questions, sir. Any of our regional uh, faculty seniors, any questions, please? Students know everything nowadays. <laughs> I don't think so. There are any questions. Uh, I would suggest uh, uh, that the students should also use, I think, West Bengal. Uh, Dr. Kaushik has written a very good book. If you all, you can suggest your students to, to read his book. I think it's a, it's a very practical aspect and uh, very beautifully written. Uh, I must appreciate that. And uh, of course, S. Das remains a, uh, along with, along with S. Das, they should read uh, Dr. Koshik's book. We have a question from Karthik, Karthik Nasipuri. So, Allen's test and Ali's test, which is for LLD measurement, which is for the limb length discrepancy measurement? Answer this question to him. It is the, uh, you see, Allen's test is, Allen test, you know, is the vascular side for, and then you do it in the wrist joint. And I think you should all know how to do a, how to do this test. But Ali's test, as we discussed, A-L-L-I-S is the test which is done for limb length discrepancy. It is an outdoor quick test for you. When you are examining in the outdoor, you get an idea, well, this is this limb is short in femoral compartment or in the tibial compartment. I think, Karthik, you have your answer. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, I want to ask two questions because uh, last PG course we faced that students has got some confusions that regarding the gate, whether gate should be described at the beginning of examination or at the end. Because some examiners suggest that you say at the end, especially in those cases where uh, there are a mixture or combination of type of gait. Uh, I, I, I can understand that. You know, uh, <laughs> this has always been a, you know, different examiners doing a different uh, kind of expectations. Uh, to my mind, I think uh, um, a patient who has come walking to you, a patient who's walk, who's come walking to you, uh, is very important. Uh, that uh, you can describe the gate right in the beginning. Yes, sir. And I've, uh, because you won't like the patient to get up again and again. You see, the sequence that we have formed is that you make a patient comfortable. So he is most comfortable if you do 
the uh, the given test at the same time <coughs> you you do a uh, you do the gate you do the trendelberg you examining while standing keep the in your mind now if the patient cannot stand obviously you can say right in the beginning that sir the patient is unable to stand so i have made him lie down that's it there are all you see obviously a fracture case will not be able to able to stand comfortably and mm. maybe uh, if it is a very painful hip you'll say no i don't want to stand so you can say that you can say that but you go with the mood of the examiner i think is very important while doing your masters examination the university based examination would be different from a national board examination you see i understand that during the covid we have started doing a virtual presentation and we have made virtual cases now uh, that has gone in a different direction now i is going to revert because uh, uh, is going to revert that we'll have oscis of course but it's going to revert in the university setup we will always have a uh, assessment of the psychomotor skills of the student so it is important that our students put their hands on the patient and they are able to uh described in a logical manner so if uh to my mind i think a gait can be a certain right in the beginning when your patient can walk because you don't have to make him uncomfortable again and again okay and uh, another thing that in the presence of any uh, fixed abduction or adduction deformity whether the student should do the trendelenburg test and then say that that out the interpretation may be wrong or they should straight away should not do it how should they approach you see uh i in i i suggest that a student should be able to do all these test and He, by the time he is finished the examination of his patient he will know it whether i should blurt it out or not i i can understand at present at, at sometimes when it is a stiff hip as well as a short hip so you know patient you can get confused <clears throat> but then towards the, as he comes to know when he examines his patient totally in a given mode this is to develop a mode for it for the student give him a objective assessment so that what happens is towards the end when you know is a stiff hip is his movements not available in in uh, in this plane so he need not to comment on the trendelberg test but he should carry out this examination but he should not give trendelberg test right in the beginning no not at all i think only gait gait he should be able to explain while trendelberg test he should keep in his pocket and bring it out at the appropriate time or if the or if the examiner asks for it that's my suggestion so that Thanks, the sir. student does not miss the the flow of examination right thank you so another question in the chat box is that yeah, we have a question here yeah, so home please go ahead uh shagotam has asked while examining the gate how long or how much do we ask the patient to walk on it uh well i i think it's a very very important question uh, i think which i miss to uh, which i miss to bring it out in my talk because you know uh, i've been traveling so i just gathered my things on it uh, didn't want to make it very elaborate uh, you see you must at least walk let the patient walk at least 10 to 15 steps and he not once he should walk you should be able to watch the gait right from the front from the side and the back these are the three important aspects when you are examining the gait you should ask your patient to at least walk for 10 to 15 steps minimum some people say 20 steps but i think 10 to 15 steps are good enough 
10 to 15 spe steps forward and then you watch the patient from back when he's walking again. So from front, back, and from the side. These are the three aspects which you should be able to examine because many a time you may miss the lurch. And another important point is that whenever <clears throat> you are doing, uh, I think uh, I missed one thing in Trendelberg, I'll repeat, if there's a short limb, at times you may get confused. So you should be able to use, to equalize the limb, use the, uh, what you call uh, wooden board to equalize the limb and then do your Trendelberg test. So these are, these are the points which must be uh, remembered uh, while doing these examinations. Arnab, I wanted to add one point. Sorry, sir, I'm interrupting. Uh, I was an examiner with one of the examiners who was fond of asking trended work even with deformities of coronal plane. So in that, the answer that he was expecting is the patient should have free abduction. If he's having free abduction but no fixed adduction, you can comment on Trendlenburg te uh, test but say it could be a false positive that way. That was what his expectation was right. when he was asking for Trendlenburg in a coronal plane deformity. Right. Mm -hmm. Kumar, uh, sir, he was an uh, examiner from Delhi itself. <laughs> I, I, I can understand that. You see, uh, uh, the, uh, the very important thing for a student to understand is he should not get offended, number one. He should be able to bring out uh, that, sir, I have done this test, but this is... Now, saying about false positive, false negative, you know, uh, again... If you if you really if you read the original text of Trendelberg, yeah. there's nothing like there's false nothing positive like or false. But we all have our own, you know, impressions and connotations. So I think uh, student, I don't think so. Examiner will give negative marks for all this. But my my, you are absolutely right. You are absolutely right. These questions have been asked, and uh, we have. Uh, seen our co-examiners asking these questions and they are baffling to the students. So my suggestion to the student is that you should examine your- Recording uh, in you progress. Should, you should examine your patient in a sequential manner and only comment on these tests towards the end of the, uh, end of your talk. Not in the beginning. Don't say it in the beginning. And you are absolutely right that if there is a you, 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 examiner is fond of it, well, sir, some amount of free abduction is available. So this 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 could be a false impression that I have got. Absolutely right. Yeah. One more question: Can gait be assessed on assisted walking? Like the stick or patient must be walked unassisted. So uh, no, you see, uh, it is very important. When uh, gait can only be assisted. Uh, can, can be assisted when he's having bipedal walking. And then you can qualify. You see, the whole point is how observant is the student? How observant is a student? The student, has he observed that can he, can he, does he walk with a stick? Does he walk with any assisted aid? So that is, if he is, if he's wearing a orthosis, naturally he'll say, I'll walk with the orthosis. He cannot walk without the orthosis. So, this can be qualified, but actual gait can only be commented without, without any <coughs> assistance. Absolutely right. If, if the student is very uh, thorough about uh, crutch walking and cane walking, Gee. different types of cane and crutch walking, then only he should comment on assisted gait. Right. right. If he does not know what is two-point gait, three-point gait, swing through, swing uh, two, he is landing in a soup. So if you're very thorough about your uh, crutch gates and uh, different patterns of crutch gate, then only comment or else say that the patient is not able to walk unassisted. I think that is the safest mode for the student. Absolutely right. Yeah. Thank you, sir. I think uh, there are no more questions. We can move forward. So, right. Uh, I think uh, Jan said, Voice is a you know giving a little giving a little problem. So I 
sir uh, can we do one or two case discussions if no i i don't uh, have any okay. case okay 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 then so we'll move on to the next session i no, think no if you uh, i would say do you have a case we can just put one case if you have a case if it is available then it's okay otherwise we can we can go ahead i think sir we can go ahead with the short spine examination that you had okay said. okay <laughs> okay 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 can i have a i'll just have a sip of water eh yeah sure sir sure sure please yes, sir. Yeah. i'll have a sip of water so in the meanwhile if anybody having any question regarding the hip examination because lot of confusions are there and uh, on the examination because we have seen that expectation are different in different type of examination so mm. it's it's a great opportunity that you make it use of it and clear everything today yeah i think more more pgd should be joining i'm hoping they will you know yeah a lot of people are seeing in youtube but they are not putting their queries there so uh, it's open no, no problem we can take the questions from there you can just yeah, you you know, my youtube is open as well so i'm just, just good evening check. yes sir good evening sir good evening or no uh, if if you have time then i can show you one hip case yes yes sir that is please sir. Please, please, please go ahead please go ahead i okay. think professor professor pal is has very kindly wanted to show us a case sir uh, please yes just, uh, just. very good evening dr pal good evening sir good evening good evening sir what, what a pleasure to hear your voice <laughs> thank you sir um, thank you just i am uh, just i'm switch over to my computer just no oh, please yes so 6 4 8 4 9 0 3 7 sir so in the meantime we have one small question what privacy yes. should be taken during walking if in examination center not have enough private space for particular case uh, i am not sure i got the question possibly it is uh pranavish can you just unmute yourself and ask the question verbatim the <clears throat> during the uh, gate checking uh, the patient should be on underwear uh, but uh, when i examine the uh, gate uh, sir told that uh, a minimum uh, 10 to 15 steps should be uh, walk uh, but okay, i got uh, it i got it i got it thank you thank you so basically sir the minimum amount was required while uh, you know uh, examining it that is what he wants to ask so right. if there is not a private space maybe a lot of people are there so uh, that may be an issue uh, you see a gate cannot be assessed unless you see the patient walking that is the most important thing you see why do we want to assess the gate we want to assess the gate what is his functional assessment you you know you got to know that the patient is having pain whether the patient is lurching on the same side so you need to have your observation on it for a, at least minimum minimum of the steps just by one or two steps he may drag himself he may just drag himself or he may put his muscles into spasm and hold it up and just drag you see you cannot assess it so uh, over a period of time it has been calculated by a observation that minimum that you should have is even if you have a small space 10 steps are minimum but it is suggested that you do at least 15 steps at least 15 steps thank you sir i think pal sir is ready with his hip case sir all please. right Pal sir, can you hear me? Pal sir, if okay. you can unmute yourself. So sir, Pal, your voice is not there. Okay. See, is my slide is visible? Yes, yeah. sir. It is visible. It is okay. visible. You are also audible now. Please, sir. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, so good evening everybody so this is a chief complaints of a 50 years old man who has a pain at right groin 
at the end of the day when he take rest since last four years oh, and the limping was uh, complained of since last one year uh, i'm requesting dr kumar sir uh, so whenever uh, you can stop and you can ask questions and you can comment uh, by yourself okay sir okay all right yes okay so this is the chief complaints uh, so next one is the elaboration of the chief complaints as actually i always i what i follow the, the, the history of presentation is consisting of three components first one is the elaboration of the chief complaints the next one is the important positive history in favor of my diagnosis and important negative history to rule out the other possible diagnosis and lastly the the cardinal symptoms like the appetite loss of weight uh, bladder bowel and sleep and uh, these uh, cardinal symptoms, whether they are affected or not, cardinal features, whether they are affected or not, because if they are affected, they indicate a sinister significance like the uh, dissemination of infection or malignant disease or like that. So this is a part A of history of present illness, that is the elaboration of the chief components. So I have elaborated in this manner that my patient was apparently all right four years back. Patient had a significant trauma by falling from height and got pain at right groin and can't move the limb. Immediately, patient was admitted to the hospital and was operated with uh, bed rest uh, uh, for three months, followed by walking with crutches. Now, six months after the operation, patient complained of full dalaking pain at right groin area only after prolonged walking when he was taking rest, which is insidious is onset and progress, progressive in nature. And for the last one year, he underwent another surgery followed by limping and pain over his groin, which was aggravated by walking and relieved by taking rest without any diurnal variation. So that is basically we are highlighting to show the rest pain from this, uh, from this elaboration of chip complaints. And this is the rest pain I've already showed. And this is the mechanical pain. For the last one year, is complaining of mechanical pain. The, both the components is of the pain is present in this case. Now the patient started limping. This is the elaboration of limping. That is the patient started limping since last one year, which is initially painless, but become painful after walking for some distance. And but relieved by taking rest and medication. Now walking distance gradually decrease and activity of daily living of the patient gradually become restricted for last one year. Now, the initially patient can sit cross-legged and squat, but now the patient can sit uh, cross-legged and squat with difficulty. So basically this suggests there is a progressive symptoms or progressive disease. Lastly, the part important positive and important negative history, important positive history in favor of my diagnosis. That is, there is no history of fever, evening rise of temperature, chronic cough, chest pain, reduce appetite and weight loss, which ruled out the infective pathology. And there is no history of night cry. So they ruled out the infective, chronic infective pathology, most uh, probably the tuberculosis. And there is no history of morning stiffness and no history of pain in other joints and uh, waxing and waning. That is how I ruled out uh, the inflammatory disorder. Uh, next is the cardinal symptoms. There is no history of loss of appetite, significant loss of body weight, bladder complaints, bladder uh, bowel complaints, and the sleep disturbance. So this is my uh, ruled out the debilitating disease like chronic infection, TB, malignant neoplasia. So this is my uh, chip complaints and plus, uh, present illness. Now past history, there is no significant uh, history like significant trauma other than this episode four years back. There is no significant childhood problem like prolonged incapacitation or fever for four weeks. No history of surgical intervention after other this episode. That ruled out the refracture, they ruled out the surgical complications, they ruled out the childhood disease like developmental disease, but this disease and the malunited fracture. And uh, the personal history, that is, I, I followed this dictum, that is the ABCDE, no history of allergy, alcoholism, addiction, no history of birth trauma, bleeding disorder, no history of contact with tuberculosis, no history of drug intake or addiction, an environment patient live in the Pakka house with annual income of 60,000. And there is no family history suggestive of familial disease, infection, and like tuberculosis. So this is the uh, history. And how you analyze the history, that is the question. 
so there is a significant trauma that is traumatic so there is a traumatic disease trauma around the groin operated so that could be the trochanteric fracture it may be intercapsular neck femur that could be the cerebellar fracture there may be fracture dislocations and uh, and uh, pain initially the rest pain later mechanical and that is a that may lead to malunion or, or articular deformation and there is a progressive symptoms of disease which may suggest non-union with upward uh, migration or the dub distal fragment under dislocation or union in the good or malposition with complications like avascular necrosis so i think uh, have that that is how i analyze the history because at, at just at the end of the history the uh, exam most of the examiner may ask what is your probable diagnosis and what are the other possible uh, differential diagnosis isn't sir so what is your comment uh, dr paul i am actually impressed by the structured history that you have formed and uh, in fact uh, you have put them in the very right brackets so you have also uh, you have also highlighted how to analyze in a very focused manner on the complaints of the patient i think is very important is very important and you have raised an excellent subjective data this is what i call a subjective data which is available to you by taking a very pertinent history very intelligent history so that you can now almost focus down you, 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 you there are only there are only two or three uh, fractures that come to your mind by 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 going into the detail and their complication you see this is what is the importance of taking history absolutely fine i think the only thing that i would uh, i would suggest that while uh, while having taken this such a elaborate history uh we should also be you know very very particular in uh, our patients of uh, of a, you know the lower section of the society where where we have a floor uh, culture the culture is floor culture that means um, most of our patients perform their activities on the floor so they at times are able they say okay i'm able to start, squat but squatting in which manner is it in the comfortable manner which is absolutely flag strip and flag knee say they managed to squat by by just by just uh, putting their knee on the ground and uh, that is one point that can be that can be elaborated uh, that's all this is just my uh, a bit of a suggestion otherwise it's an excellent history very structured in a very sequential manner i must uh, i must congratulate you dr paul for uh, for making this uh, this uh, this uh, what you call ppt for educating the students thank you sir so any other comments from other faculty sir okay so i'll, I'll proceed uh, so actually i def uh, divide the any pain for the for the students like any pain that can be uh, mechanical that may be inflammatory or the infective neoplastic that is uh, basically it helps the student to categorize the disease so yeah, because this is the same same thing that is at the end of the history student may be asked what is the uh, you know, what is the probable diagnosis so in that case the broad category of the diagnosis can be sorted out so that will help you just to questions what is the aggravating factor and what is the relieving factor so if the aggravating factor of pain is mechanic that is, is activity and the rest is the relieving factor of that pain is the it is a mechanical pain is just opposite rest is the aggravating factor and the activity is the relieving factor it is the inflammatory but is the infective and neoplastic as the uh, pain is constantly present so there will be always there is activity is the aggravating factor but there is no relieving factor unless it is taking some medicine or surgery anything so that is the way now the general survey the, of the same patients is a patient conscious cooperative build normal asthenic build nutrition is average pallor is uh, it is not present cyanosis not present icterus clubbing it is not present temperature is the patient is febrile 
neck veins are not engorged, neck, neck glands are not palpable, their vitals are like this, as I can mention here. So anything to be comment, sir, regarding the general survey? No, I think absolutely, absolutely fine. Yeah. Okay. Please go ahead. Now the so this is the gate of the patient. Is it visible, sir? Oh yes, it is visible. Yeah. Sir, is there a video? Uh, yes, it is a video. No, video can't be seen, sir. Is it can't be seen, na? No, 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 no. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. So uh, I think uh, it's not seen. Okay. Still, uh, we, can, we can see the photographs. Yeah. Okay. So the instruction from standing is the head central in position, right shoulder is same level, anterior thigh appears to be wasted in comparison with the left. From the lateral side, there is no exaggeration of lumbar lordosis. There is surgical scar mark is present. It is eight centimeter length. Linear at the upper lateral aspect of the thigh, it is it is there, uh, which healed by primary intention. It's a surgical scar, as uh, Sar is suggested. We have to understand. Now, standing from the back, there is a head central, right shoulder at the lower level, and uh, scapula at the same level, but there is a scoliosis. How do you know the scoliosis? There is some see, there is some trunk limb space is abnormal. Trunk limb space is asymmetrical. Trunk limb space suggest there is a possibility of this coronal pendiformity of the spine. And so this scoliosis immediately, if it is obliterated, once the patient is asked to lean forward. So that is basically, it is, it is a, a, it's not a structural scoliosis, it is a compensatory scoliosis, most probably due to some uh, hip pathology and which should be confirmed by sit as the patient, asking the patient to sit down and to see whether the scoliosis is completely corrected or not. When the patient stands, uh, this right knee is uh, flexed. That may suggest there is a possibility of limb and discrepancy. And also, this is wasting of the uh, hamstring muscles, which is ob obvious on the back of the right thigh. Now, uh, inspection from supine position. See the ASIS. ASIS is at, a, at the same level. Uh, now, there are some questions maybe asked how clinically or how do you know whether it is the same level? So um, can anybody volunteer from the participant? How will you confirm that ASI is at a same level? There are several ways. That is, uh, first of all, you have to uh, examine it and you have to see whether the line joining the both ASIs at, remain at right angle to the umbilicus to the CPS with this one. Second, if there is some doubt whether it is at a higher level or lower level, if it is at a higher level, then it may be due to adduction deformity. And then according to the theory, if there is adduction deformity, abduction deformity should, abduction movement should not be there. So you have to check the abduction. So if the abduction is there, that may be, that indicates it is not a true adduction deformity. So in this way, this is a back calculation, by this back calculation, you can easily understand whether it is at a, uh, truly at the same level or not. Next, the anterior thigh, is appears to be wasted in comparison. Anterior thighs is appeared to be wasted in comparison to the left side. Right lower limbs appears to be short in comparison uh, to the left lower limb as we can check the heel distance. It is a uh, asymmetry of the level of the heel. Next is a no exaggerated lumbar lordosis. We can, if you see from the side and patella looks just away from the roof, as you can see here, but just uh, from the, that may be some possibility of uh, external rotation deformity. Uh, when uh, see this is the this is the same test as, as I'm doing. I'm showing that the as it is doubtful. We have to do this look at the angle on the both side. This that should be the right angle. The root is also the abduction adduction. Now from inspection sir, I can so, uh, anything to be added. Oh, no, it's, I think absolutely you are going uh, in an absolutely fine way. A absolutely fine. Absolute. Otherwise, I would say that the patient was, when you were examining the patient in standing, I would suggest that at that time, you should make the patient walk at least 15, 10 to 15 steps, number one, so that you can uh, you can find out the gait because you don't have to keep uh, you have to keep uh, you don't have to disturb the patient again and again. 
uh, and also perform your Trendelberg test and keep it in your mind. Keep it with you. Keep it with you performing the Trendelberg test. This is what I suggest when you have made your patient stand. Thank you, sir. Okay, now palpation, there is a local temperature is normal over the right scarpa strangle. Tenderness entry point is non tender. Token direct tenderness is not there. By token direct compression test is also negative. Now, palpation of the confirmation of the bony points, ASI is at the same level, right token at the higher level, the left, which is not tender, not thickened, broadened, and it's not irregular. A surgical scar mark of 8 cm at the upper lateral part of the aspect of the proximal thigh, which is non tender, mobile, non attached to the underlying structure, and healed by primary intention. There is a bilateral femoral pulse is palpable and good volume. Inguinal lymph nodes are not significantly palpable. The movements I actually I I, I follow this this sort of uh, chart. There is movements. So the left side is the normal and the right side is a disease. Flexion is uh, left side as it is normal. So it's one twenty. It should be zero to one twenty. It should be ideally as uh, Sari suggested. This is not the right way. We have to write it down the range arc of motion. The zero to one twenty is not. And similarly, on the right side, whether it is it, uh, it is started with the zero or not. And if it is in the deformity, you can start with the 10 degree flexion deformity or by 10 to 100 like that. And lastly, the, whether it is associated with pain or not. So internal rotation in flexion, internal rotation in extension, external rotation in flexion, external rotation in extension. As you can see here, the internal rotation in extension and the flexion is different in this case. Similarly, external rotation in flexion and extension, it is different. So there is some sectorial involvement of the femoral head, we can suggest. As you can, if you see the flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, of which the flexion is maximally uh, preserved, uh, whether the other movements, especially the abduction and the uh, and the rotation, are maximally involved. So there is an asymmetrical involvement of the movements, which is suggests there is some mechanical uh, defect of the femoral head. That and that, that that is the basis of the this sectorial involvement. Which is uh, uh, which is clearly identified by this uh, differential uh, rotation, as you can see here. This is a flexion, uh, as you can sectorial sign. I'm not going to detail as Sari is elaborately uh, discussed about that external rotation, internal rotation, and the measurement. The measurement. So there are always there is some uh, apparent measurement followed by true measurement, and of the gut measurement. So basically, there is a true shortening. Apparent uh, uh, true shortening is equal to apparent shortening as there is no abduction and abduction deformity, and there is a one centimeter uh, less gut on the right side. There is two centimeter supratrochanteric shortening that uh, is, it is on the right side. And the special test I have done there is a Tendelberg test positive, telescopic test uh, it is it is it is a negative, an active SLR. With or without resistance, that is a stint field test uh, for the lateral tear. It is also uh, it is negative. Other signs like other joints like the uh, the new neurological vascular reticular endothelial system, they are also done and there are no significant abnormalities detected. So the Telework test is an inspector palpatory method. Patient must uh, sit or stand from the back, as Jasari is nicely described. And there are some prerequisites. It is asked what are the prerequisites of the Tenderberg test, uh, what is the inference of the Tenderberg test, whether the Tenderberg test can be done in coronal plane deformity or not. If it is done, what should the inter interpretation? So, different types of questions may be asked in the examination. So, summary this is extremely important. So this is my case, it is a 50 years old major male patient, it is presented with significant trauma around groin, operated followed by dull arcing pain in the right groin. Since last four years, which is insidious, is onset gradually progressive in nature. Then there is complaining of limping after walking for some distance with pain aggravated by walking and relieved by the taking rest without any diurnal variation for last one year. There is no history of fever, evening rise of temperature, and no history of morning stiffness, pain in other joints. On examination, there is a short limb gait. On inspection, right quadriceps, right, uh, right quadriceps and, uh, is uh, wasted. A right limb appears shortened in comparison with the left side with secondary scoliosis. 
which is uh, compensatory to short, uh, shortening of the right lower limb. Greater trochanteriors at the higher level than the left without any tenderness and the thickening. A linear surgical scar mark of 8 cm at the la uh, lateral side of the thigh, which healed by primary intention. On palpation, the anterior point is non tender. There is restriction of the internal rotation and external rotation of the hip, which changed with hip flexion. The resectoral sign positive with asymmetrical restriction of the hip motions, of which maximally hip motion preserved is the flexion, maximum hip, uh, hip motion affected is the abduction and internal rotation. There is supratrochanteric shortening of two centimeter and tenil mark test is positive. So my diagnosis is, so uh, my diagnosis is a provisional diagnosis, a post-traumatic, post-operative coxavera deformity without malunion of fracture neck of femur uh, uh, with possible osteonecrosis of the right femoral head of four years duration in a 50 years old male laborer. So uh, sir, comment please. Uh, I think uh, is absolutely right, your provisional diagnosis. Uh, but how did you say for coxa vera? Coxa vera uh, will be uh, difficult is, for me. Yeah, that may, may not be mentioned over here. Maybe it's a post traumatic, mm. uh, my provisional diagnosis may be yeah. stopped. There's a post traumatic, post operative. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, with, uh, with the possibility of a osteonecrosis. Yeah, because you have an axis deviation in your patient that is uh, that need to that has been elaborated already uh, yeah that's right so it's i think coxa vera because for coxa vera yeah you can say because it becomes a it becomes difficult to say coxa vera by by just uh, by just uh, doing this examination because you know otherwise what will happen the examiner will suspect the, uh, the the student oh are you seen the x rays my dear <laughs> yes, yes. so i think yes. we need to be careful as a as a student and uh, postgraduate student should keep so many things in his uh, in his pocket so that he can you know the examiner can ask later on why there is an uh, why there is uh, why you have a abduction range is restricted why do you think abduction range is restricted in this patient so then you know you can th thought process can come in yes that could be the diagnosis maybe the uh, post operative post uh, post traumatic post operative uh, malunate <coughs> malunate yeah. the proximal femur that's right that's right. The because femur. yeah osteonecrosis will go more with the coxa verga you see, wherever there is a, we say that supralateral aspect of the of the very well fixed hips in um, in fracture neck of femur may lead to osteonecrosis of the supralateral aspect of the femur, femoral head. So I think coxa vera should be kept in pocket. Exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> and the differential diagnosis is the early degenerative arthritis following the post-traumatic, post-traumatic uh, post vascular necrosis, femoral head, secondary degenerative arthritis. So these are the, the say, see, uh, please go through the, sir, please go through this uh, differential diagnosis, whether that should be relevant or not, whether uh, it should be kept or anything to be added. No, he can say in order of priority, <clears throat> in order of priority, I think, if I was a student, I would have said, in order of priority, I think it is a, possibly a malunited fracture neck of femur. Exactly. And now he's, the patient has started painful activity. He's gone, in, it's, it's painful. So it must have gone, undergone into second, secondary osteoarthrosis because it's four years duration. So four years duration, though it is little early, but then they can go into uh, as the osteonecrosis takes place, um, then they go into degenerative change. So he can say that secondary osteoarthrosis, okay. possibly because of osteonecrosis. I think he's absolutely right. Can it be a central fracture dislocation? No, it cannot be a fracture, central fracture dislocation, but then he'll have to keep in mind that can it be a central fracture dislocation? No, because the rotations are not grossly restricted. Exactly. And you have a range of abduction and adduction available in this patient. So, 
I think basotrochanteric fracture, yes. Um, it can be a basotrochanteric fracture, malunited basotrochanteric fracture. And then it fits into a coxavara. Much, you know, it goes into coxavara. So fracture dislocation, very, very uh, remote possibility of fracture dislocation, but could have, it could have been a fracture dislocation to start with, which, which was reduced. I, how do I know that this, uh, this hip was, uh, uh, <clears throat> didn't have a fracture dislocation? I don't know. So it could have been a fracture dislocation of the right hip, which was uh, a surgical fixation was done. Well, it is unlikely to be a infective arthritis. Very, very unlikely to be a infective arthritis. There is a positive history of trauma following which surgical intervention, following which he was much better. Then he started deteriorating. So I think uh, it is a traumatic diagnosis. You are absolutely right. Uh, except that I don't disagree, I don't agree with the coxavara to be brought in right in the absolutely. initial stage. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Professor Pal, yes, 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 please. There is a question from the. I think uh, one question is there: How to show or explain the axis deviation? Uh, please explain that. There was a question. Yes, sir. As just described, so axis deviation. If you if flex the knee, if you ask the patient to flex the knee. So what happens? It is normally what happens that there is a your, your if if you ask the patient normally so normally the, the the once in the journey to flex the hip the knee will starts to go to the opposite shoulder. It is a normal side. But if instead of going to the opposite shoulder, if it, is, it goes towards the same shoulder or just away from the same shoulder, so they, if that is known as the axis deviation. So the, that is basically due to some. Uh, the, the three-dimensional deformity of the proximal capital epiphysis. So as the, just as the patient to uh, flex, the, uh, flex the thigh so that his thigh will touch, will come to touch the abdomen. So and see the journey, whether in this journey to flex the hip, whether this the knee goes towards the opposite shoulder or not. This is the basically uh, we have to check. Uh, absolutely right. I think, uh, Dr. Paul, you have very well said that. Uh, at times, uh, you know, you may have to just give a little support onto the heel. Just hold the heel very gently okay. of your patient and ask him to flex the hip to the maximum what he can. And you will find, you will see that instead of going in the in the same towards the same hip or to the towards the other side, it goes away from the midline. The, the, the hip goes away from the midline when you are flexing. Now that indicates that there is an axis deviation. There is an axis deviation. Absolutely. One one can either do it actively also if the patient is uh, you know pain free or absolutely pain free, you can do it absolutely pain free or you can hold the hold the limb that means the heel in the cup of your hand and then ask the patient to flex it now absolutely right you see rotations also this is this is demonstration of axis deviation yes. but then if there is a differential rotations that are available to you in extension and when you do flexion, ask to do rotations in flexion, there is a restriction of internal rotation. Then you will find that there is a, there is a discrepancy in extension and flexion. This indicates that the patient has a sectorial sign is available to the patient. This means that the head of femoral head has either become spheroidal in shape that this only indicates a spheroidal shape of the femoral head. You see, it, uh, it, it's, it's lost its globular shape. This is what it indicates. Uh, there is one more comment that I have uh, while you are palpating for the lymph nodes. I would suggest that 
the 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 iliac fossa must always be uh, palpated for lymph nodes that is external iliac group of lymph nodes because they are very important sign very important sign for any infective pathology in the hip joint this must be uh, this must be remembered by our postgraduate students while examining the hip for lymph nodes and uh, uh, another point which has been very well emphasized is that no examination of the limbs can ever be complete without doing neurovascular examination i think uh, the case presented was uh, very well elaborated and structured thank you dr park thank you sir thank you sir so i'm stop i'm, I'm stopping to swear okay thank you sir <laughs> pleasure doc paul it has been excellent i must say that and i'm so pleased to see you thank you sir thank you sir <laughs> okay thank you uh, dr paul i would take this opportunity to welcome dr shonnanto samanto sir welcome yes, thank yes. you namaskar i think namaskar to jain sir also jain sir is also there yeah yeah, yeah jain sir is there he was there since the beginning sir yeah, yeah so i think we can move on to the spine session sir after that we'll go to shamanta sir for the knee session okay okay yes yes uh, dr shamanta and namaskar species and yes. namaskaram namaskaram and good to see you good to see you uh, uh, you know i was not expecting that i'll see you so soon eh? <laughs> but it's very nice we just met a met a month back is it yeah 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 good good sir uh, you see i i i they have asked me to talk about spine actually i've been traveling i've been away from home so um, i don't carry those things with me but then i'll just i noted down few points in my mind and i'll just come out with it you see while examining the spine the uh, you see it is a very mathematical examination and a student should be uh proud that he has got a spine case because either you can score 100% or you can fall out so both things can happen so you need to have a very structured uh method of examination and it is i think uh, goes without saying that you need to have <clears throat> you need to have your uh, your neurology very well read you must remember that there are 33 vertebrae in the human body and there are about 31 pairs of nerve roots and there are 23 discs and you have a spinal cord which ends at l1 level and uh, then you have a conus medullaris and then uh, you also have a phylum terminate and then you have uh, your uh, coracoid quad so i think it is this this uh, is very simple and one has to remember it very well and another is uh, <clears throat> another aspect is that uh, <clears throat> that um, uh, spine is also affected in the similar manner as as our appendicular system or any other part of the body is affected with so it has a uh, congenital disorder inflammatory disorder degenerative disorders <clears throat> infective disorders and uh, traumatic disorders so most of the time that the cases that are given to the students are uh, those of uh, either infective which is basically <clears throat> we have a endemic area uh, that is uh, tuberculosis of spine <clears throat> or a trauma uh, most of the time we look for uh, tuberculosis of spine to be given to a patient to our students also another another type of a case that is being given to you is is a what we call as prolapsed intervertebral disc <clears throat> so um is important to know when you are exam when you are taking history from your patient 
that uh, you know i'll i'll just summarize that age age is very important no doubt because that gives you <coughs> sorry hey, just a minute i'll just take a glass of water is important to uh, ascertain the age of your patient and the occupation which remains a, a basic uh, data raising then uh, uh, what has been the occupation of your patient what is his age and uh, whether there is any history of trauma or not now most of the time uh, the patient will come to you if he comes walking to you he can, he can have three basic symptoms either the symptoms can be pertaining to axial axial symptoms or patient may be having radicular symptoms or patient may be having weakness which we call as myelopathic symptoms upper limb or lower limb so if you remember that there are three basic symptoms that the patient can present to you with and another important thing that he can have following all this is he can have pain so all the parameters of pain must be assessed he can have a deformity in the spine right or he can have a weakness a motor weakness or a sensory deficit so or he can have a bladder and bowel involvement or he can have or and another is that you should ask for uh, constitutional symptoms i think these are broader aspects that i am that i that i i think of uh, when we are taking a history of a patient and then you get elaborate each one of them accordingly so in our day to day practice if we can just remember that the patient comes to us with either axial symptoms which are most of the time degenerative stuff or he can come with the radicular symptoms which may be radicular symptoms are most of the time a disc problem or uh, uh, yeah most of the time a disc problem or he can come with a myelopathic symptoms that means weakness and weakness in the limbs not able to walk or uh, or uh, not able to move his hand or fingers so that is all a myelopathic symptoms so with these broader uh, history taking i think we can proceed on to examination so far as examination is concerned again if the patient comes to you walking then it is a different thing that you have to examine the gait of your patient as he comes to you and uh, uh, that means uh, whether the gait is spastic or not i think that is the major thing that you look into whether the gait is spastic or not and uh, whether uh, levels of the his shoulder level of his head had is there any rotations like in that you find in torticollis and uh, so you start you start right from top to bottom and i think one of the pictures that uh, that uh, dr paul showed uh, very well regarding scoliosis so you have a scoliosis which is uh, which you can uh, you know you can ascertain by the level of the shoulder uh, whether it is compensatory or whether it is uh, structural and uh, you see you look at the limbs there is a gap between the arm uh, uh, between the trunk and the arm uh, so uh, you see that the uh, the, mm, the the whether there is a uh, curvature to the right or curvature to the left so you you can examine that where the patient is standing and and that is there any swelling before that you should be able to uh you see you should be able to see if there is a level of the shoulders and level of the scapula from behind when you are examining your patient and uh, and any tilting of the head on left side or right side any rotations and uh, yeah if there is any bed sores we, then that's that you see in the lying down position uh, of course uh, to those having bed sores you hope the patient won't be standing and that is uh, is there any deformity yes so you have seen whether there is this uh, where there is a where there is a curvature of the spine or there is a bump in the spine which we which we call as a, a gibbous or a kyphosis 
Uh, and uh, from the lateral profile, again, you see whether there is a mm, uh, uh, whether there is any uh, any gibbous, uh, which is more prominent while you're seeing the patient from a lateral profile. You look for any sinuses, swelling, and uh, puckering of the skin. And uh, just like in spina bifida, you may just have uh, a telltale story of a spina bifida. And uh, there could be pigmentation, puckering, tuft of hairs. So all those uh, points you must be able to note. Then you come on after you have done this, then you can at the same time, also, while the patient is standing, uh, you you can uh, you can uh, mark the spinous processes and also palpate the spinous processes. So while palpating, it is very important that you should mark your spinous processes from from at least uh, the most prominent part of the of the spinous process that you clinically are able to ascertain is in fact T1, because uh, we say that C7 is the longest uh, spinous process of all the, uh, all the cervical spine. But, uh, but the one which you can clinically ascertain, which is most prominent is T1. And then uh, as a patient is standing, you know, you can mark the level of the uh, inferior angle of the scapula, the spine of the scapula and down below, of course, on the highest point of the iliac crest, the line crossing that. And you also look for any uh, dimple of venous. And uh, when you have marked all this, then you start palpating the spine, which is more very important. And the palpation should be done by your middle finger. It is important that with the middle finger, you palpate the spinous processes from top to bottom. From top to bottom, you come down, and this gives you an excellent feeling onto your the pulp of your middle finger, whether there is any prominence in the spinous processes. If there is an extra spinous process prominence, you must zero down that. Then you start examining whether it is tender or not. So the tenderness can be elicited. Of course, uh, you can do that in the lying down position. We'll come down on it. But then you have, if the patient is walking and has come to you, then you'll have to do all these tests. And then, then you, in a, in, a, in a walking patient, you do flexion, extension, rotations, and they are best demonstrated when the patient is sitting. At the same time, you should also be able to take the chest expansion of your patient. And the chest expansion can be done at memory level or it can be done at different default sternum. Both of these is, uh, you know, in female it's difficult, but in, uh, you can do that at default sternum. And uh, note down what is the chest expansion like. And then, you can do the movements of the spine and cervical spine, you know, the movements can be done, flexion, extension, uh, rotations, and little bending, and uh, note down uh, your ranges. And while sitting, you can do the best part of your lumbar spine uh, movements. So, and then, of course, uh, I think this would, uh, and of course, I, I, I think uh, the temperature, the temperature and this, if uh, you must be able to first, when you palpate, you must be able to also able to find out whether the, what the local temperature like. And, uh, and uh, any swelling, deformity, we have already discussed. Now, depending on this, if your patient is a walking patient, then you will do. You can do a Schober's test by 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 taking a tape, and you know that how much is the distance, uh, right? Ten to fifteen centimeters. You take and uh, you take it from a fixed point, 
and then see while patient is fracturing how much he opens up the spinous processes. That is important, and that gives you a lot of uh, lot of information. And uh, so far as the as the mobility of the spine is concerned, uh, another is that while the patient is a walking patient that comes to you, then you do your special tests like. Uh, you make the patient uh, lie down, and you can do um, you do your uh, what you call uh, straight leg raising passive passive SLR, and you lift the limb, asking your patient to absolutely leave the limb floppy and lift the limb up with uh, with holding the uh, heel, and uh, if the patient feels any 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 radiating pain or not. Uh, at certain level, which is most important between 30 to 60 degree, between you say beyond 60 degree or some people say 70 degree, but I think three to 60 degree is the one, 30 to, sorry, 30 to 60 degree is the one which is most important. And then uh, you can add the many experiences of pain, uh, radicular pain, it tells you that I'm, I'm getting a stretch pain. This is all a test for stretch pains and uh, uh, you lower the, the low, uh, at the point of of the stretch pain. You lower the uh, lower the limb, and again, um, what do you call uh, press on to do a dorsiflexion. And if it is positive, that is uh, what we call as good Lessigius test. So these tests can be performed, and there are uh, many other tests which are available for cervical spine. I think I'm not going to go in detail of that. We let us do the examination of the patient while the patient is lying down. Now, all these things you can, uh, uh, you can say that the patient is being examined in a lying down position. I have not been able to make the patient sit because the patient has got weakness in the lower limbs and he's unable to, unable to walk and stand. So you, you, you start doing then uh, a, 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 what you call as neurological examination, which we call as uh, uh, motor test. Uh, we do a motor and sensory examination of these patients. So uh, the full neurological examination is a must. And uh, before that, uh, you should be able to uh, uh, hire mental functions and cranial nerves must be known to all of our students. And uh, as a matter of uh, protocol, they should be able to uh, say that uh, cranial nerves are normal because uh, we don't give you any case uh, with the cranial nerve injuries or cranial nerve affections and uh, power of stereoglasis and coordinated movements. And after that, you come on to the examination of the spine in which uh, you do examination of the spine most of the time in the lateral position, the most comfortable position. And then in that position, you will be unable to, uh, unable to you know, indicate the level of the shoulders and uh, shoulder level should not be commented on. And what you do is uh, you palpate the spinous processes and wherever there is a prominence, you elicit the tenderness by giving a pressure onto the lateral aspect of the spinous process. And this is how you elicit tenderness onto the spine. And this is important because this, if you do that, you will be able to, able to produce a, uh, a rotational effect onto the vertebrae, and that will give a tenderness onto the anterior part of the vertebral column. With this, uh, the muscles, uh, paraspinal muscles may stand out, and uh, uh, there has been a confusion at times. Some people have been talking about tapping the muscles to get the uh, spasm. No, tapping a muscle will give you, uh, that, is a, that is not, uh, that is not, the, that's not the way 
to demonstrate tenderness onto the spine. That is a, what do you call a neurological spasm that you, that you are irritating the muscle by just tapping it. That is not the one which is being irritated by the underlying joint. So one must distinguish it, the distinguish between it and uh, should, uh, should take away the confusion on this. So another important part is uh, while examining your spine uh, is that uh, uh, if there is a if there is a involvement of two vertebrae or three vertebrae, uh, you can distinguish by counting the the vertebrae uh, the spinal spaces from top to bottom. Then you come on to your neurological examination, of course, and uh, uh, what I suggest is that. Neurological examination in any given case of, uh, of uh, paraplegia uh, should be done right from top to bottom. That means upper limbs, you should be able to say the upper limbs are normal if it is a paraplegic patient. And then you come on to the, uh, come on to the um, examination right onto the, onto the intercostal muscles, whether the, whether the patient is breathing uh, normally or there is a paradoxical breathing. And uh, <clears throat> and you try to pick up uh, pick up one muscle for one root trend, and that is uh, I say that in upper limbs you you take uh, abduction that means deltoid for C five, and you take uh, your uh, flexion of the uh, elbow of C six and C seven your uh, what do you call as uh, triceps and. Uh, uh, C8 as your um, uh, flexor, the, 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 what you call the um, deep flexors of your uh, sternum uh, for the, uh, of the uh, middle finger. And T1, you take uh, abduction of the little finger. Similarly, uh, in your chest, you are uh, examining right on to um, right onto your intercostal muscles, whether they are opening up or not, or there's a paradoxical breathing. When you come down onto the abdomen, you must do a Weber's test. You must do a Weber's test and uh, you will know whether the lesion is uh, affecting the uh, B10 level or below it or not. And then come down onto your lower limbs, uh, L1, you see the root flexure, the root tuberosus, and uh, sorry, L3. L3 uh, uh, and uh, your um, uh, inner swap, sorry, L2, I'm sorry, L2 level, L2 level, it will give you L, L2 level basically. And when you come on to the quadriceps, it will give you L3 level. If you come onto the ankle, it will give you your L4 level. So you take the one dorsiflexion, quick examination, and then you come on to your great toe, and that will give you L5 level. and and flexion of the extension of the great toe will give you L5 level and flexion will give you, flexion will give you S1 level. So this, this you know, quick examination of your muscle power can be done uh, while in lying, in a patient is lying down. Similarly, your sensory, sensory deficit can, should be uh, very well done by knowing your double tip in the upper limbs as well as in the chest as well as in the lower limbs. And then you come on to your, basically on to your, um, let's say you come on to your uh, reflexes. So uh, superficial reflex and deep reflex. So superficial reflexes you do uh, <coughs> uh, abdominal reflexes and abdominal reflexes uh, in the upper quadrant and the lower quadrant, right and left should be done. And, uh, and then you should do your Wabliski test. And uh, after that, you, you can do, of course, uh, in, in Wales, you do a, mm, uh, what you call as, uh, uh, yeah, Wales, you do, um, I think your valgo cavernous reflex can be done. And uh, you can do that, valgo cavernous reflex. If patient, uh, patients, those who are on the, uh, on the catheter, you can give a small tag in the catheter and uh, look at the LSD. 
So, and another test that you can do is Zamniski, of course, and then you come on to any clonus, whether the clonus is there in the ankle, ankle clonus, whether it is, I think you know, one should be able to say about sustained, ill-sustained, well-sustained or ill-sustained. I think these two don't, don't go into the details of uh, <coughs> degree of clonus, but whether, whether it is ill-sustained or, or well-sustained, I think that, that, that will suffice. And at the same time, you can also elicit spasticity, and that is what we call a Splatchman type of spasticity, which is most important. And after that, we, of course, dermatomes, your dermatome involvement, we have already discussed. And then deep reflexes and uh, for the upper limbs and lower limbs. And their, uh, their root value should be well, uh, <coughs> the root value should be very well uh, uh, remembered. And then uh, another thing that now you have almost got your data with you, almost got your data you've got a full, uh, what do you call, um, objective data available to you. And uh, uh, then you can start analyzing whether it is an upper motor neuron or a lower motor neuron. If it is, and then upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron, and uh, you should know the difference between the two. And then you start, uh, then you start finding out where is the sensory loss. And when you sensory loss, let's say at T10, now if you find that sensory loss is at T10, and you know that the, then you have to understand the levels of the cord. Uh, how do how do we add up onto the levels of the cord with the vertebrae? So uh, you start right from uh, let's say in cervical spine uh, at uh, C7, you you add one. Uh, in the cervical spine, you add one. And while in uh, thoracic spine, you from one to six, uh, you must remember you had two, and from seven to nine, you had three, three segments, and at E10 is represented, thoracic 10 is represented, uh, uh, representing the L1 and L2 segments. While um, E11 will represent the uh, L3 and L4 segments, and uh, T12 will represent uh, L5 segments. So, and the cord will fill, will end at the L1 level. Then, then the L1 level, you have a second segment, and then you have, of course, your uh, conus medullaris and uh, and uh, phylum femoral and uh, your uh, choroid phylum. So now you will know that what in a, in a sensory loss. Say, let's say sensory loss has uh, sensory loss at somewhere around L1 level, or uh, so you know that if it is L1 level, that means somewhere it should be thoracic 10, the say thoracic 10 level. So thoracic 10 vertebrae. So that's how you you start correlating. So that means you must marry your uh, findings with uh, with uh, clinical observation, and <clears throat> an upper motor neuron or a lower motor. So you will be able to now come on to your diagnosis. If it is in the upper motor neuron, that means the patient will have some kind of a compressive myelopathy. And if it is a lower motor neuron, then it may be either a radicular symptoms or caudal corner syndrome. So then you start in, then you start analyzing that whether it is extra dural. That means extra dural either in the body or in the soft tissue or in the extra dural region, and whether it is intradural, extra medullary, or it is intradural, uh, intradural, intramedullary, or intramedullary. So, so you, the, the, these these are the these are the classification that you should keep in mind while you have. Uh, you when while you exam while you analyzing uh, your your observations uh, clinically that you are doing. While in trauma case, of course, uh, you will have to remember uh, uh, in the trauma cases again the same thing. But you will have to uh, you will have to analyze the muscles individually, muscle groups, and uh, rather than picking up one one muscle at a time. I think. Uh,
almost I have given you a, a very broad outline of, uh, of a spine examination. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I, I think this was really elaborate one. And I think most of the things I think if they have been uh, listening carefully to you, they have understood. Absolutely, sir. It was a wonderful, uh, you know, talk. Uh, very, very elaborate and detailed about the entire, you know, spinal examination and everything. Uh, I think we have a small question. Uh, is it necessary to mark each spinous process? And what needs, what points to mark on a spine case? You see, uh, uh, it's, it's uh, I think uh, you need, it, need not to mark each and every spinous process, but uh, for counting, at least you should be able to mark uh, in a in a paraplegic patient at least uh, two places at least one thoracic one which is the most prominent clinically and uh, the highest point of uh, of the iliac crest because rest of the uh, rest of the points that you have uh, in a paraplegic patients are uh, are uh, not exact you see, so these two points are very important and they're good enough to count your vertebrae. And another thing is that if you have a prominence of the vertebrae, that vertebrae must be, uh, that spinous process must be highlighted. So you can count the vertebrae. Um, it is not necessary to mark each and every one, but it's good to mark because in a lying down position, but then uh, you see the positions can change. You must be able to say that I have done it in a prone position or I have done it in a lateral position. You know, many a times what happens, as, what have we have observed during uh, these uh, examinations, the student can get uh, worked up. Uh, whether he should, uh, you know, when he's changing the position, when he's showing you in the lateral position and then making him supine, uh, you know, these, these, these marks change because uh, this will depend on the positions. So you should be able to mark, at least to my mind, these three marks. And so that you can demonstrate to your examiner. And you know, still there can be small changes, but it is all acceptable because nobody can be absolutely exact. So you, at least you have tried, you have shown to your examiner that, sir, I have marked these spinous processes to count the vertebrae because this is how I count it. I did not mark at the say uh, spine of the scapula or the inferior angle of the scapula because they are mobile structures. They are mobile so they will not give me any indication. Right. So it's, uh, this is what I would suggest. Right. Thank you. Uh, I think we would move on to the last session for the day, the knee examination by Shaman Prasad. Sir, please. Thank you, Kumar, sir, for your nice explanation on the hip and the spine. Now, we'll be just having an overview of the knee examination. Okay, Soham? Yes, sir. We're all ready. Go ahead. Just if there is any question, you take some time because I have to just one minute. I have to just locate. Okay. I know that, um, you know, this, uh, this spine examination, uh, possibly uh, because I didn't have the slides along with me, you know, so uh, I could not tap all these. So I thought I will just uh, talk about it. And if I, I know that there will be a lot of questions. The, and uh, I would welcome them and uh, so that we can clarify certain things. But my suggestion is that whenever you're doing a neurological examination, especially uh, you should do from top to bottom so that you do not miss many times, you know, uh, uh, what you have is upper limb involvement as well. So you should do a right from top to bottom and you should be able to uh, also do a beaver's test because uh, many a times the expansion of the chest and the beaver's test are missed by the student and they give you a lot of information and also give you additional points when you are when you are presenting your case 
of course, a neurovascular, the vascular examination should also be done. So that means right. you must palpate all the all the vessels. You must palpate, and especially uh, the abdominal aorta as well, because many times uh, I know though it is rare, but then abdominal aorta must be uh, must be palpated, must be palpated in all spine cases. Absolutely, sir. Tom, you can run from your side. Otherwise, there is some uh, delay from my side. If you can uh, give me 30 seconds, I will be joining. Okay. Just one second. I have just looked at Okay, sir. Please take your time for one. Yeah. Could I be? I uh, have to could, sir, sir. could I be excused? You know, I have to just rush. Yes, for... sir. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, yeah, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, time and valuable opinion and valuable presentation. Thank you. We are very much obliged, sir. Oh, thank my you. pleasure. Uh, my pleasure, Somyo. And thanks to the thank faculty. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. We'll meet in Kolkata soon. Okay, thank you, sir. sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, you, sir. okay, Paul. Uh, it's been a real pleasure, and thank you, Samantha, and uh, my young man. Thank you, dear. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.
kayak gue belum Dr. Ashok Sham, sir, yes, audio is there. Actually, we are just waiting for Dr. Shamanta to get on uh, with the presentation. There seems to be some technical problem. He's not able to do his screen sharing. We are trying to get the presentation started uh, in some other way.
Hello, Arnav. Hello. Hello. Sir, Bolun, Achi Achi, tell me. I am just trying to download it. Obishek the is trying. I am also trying to download in screen share from my own screen. Just give me two moments, Ramjit. Because one of the phone I was in a second. I'm a good, evening, sir. Good, evening, good evening, sir. Good evening, sir. I'm also, I'm also trying to open the document here. I'll just uh, update okay. you. Now, some of the net connection went off. I, I now I'm joining from the mobile. I think you would just run over there, then I can do my yeah. job. Sure, sir. Sure. What are you doing? Mostly will be on. Can you see, sir? Is it visible? Now it is visible. Now it is visible. Okay. Hello. So, yes. it, is, it is visible now. It is being shared, no? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Kindly, kindly start, sir. Kindly start. I think uh, during the last PG course, we have already discussed about the some uh, this part of the knee examination. But I will just run through and whatever because knee case will definitely will come as a short case, not as a long case. But you have to uh, be very. Partic uh, particular about the your some clinical tests otherwise it is uh, very mm -hmm. difficult mm -hmm. to impress the examiners so when you take the history for the your knee case it can be either non traumatic or traumatic one mostly for your non traumatic uh, you can get some sort of uh, infective etiology or else some tumorous condition some exostosis uh, the your patellar subluxation the habitual dislocation all these cases you might be getting and some cases you'll be getting for the trauma, you might be getting some meniscal injuries because meniscal injuries are sometimes painful. So you don't get those in the exam, but you might get a, uh, your ACL injury or a PCL injury. Okay. So traumatic history is very, very important. Whether there is a trauma and whether the, the what is the nature of violence, then what is the position of the knee, direction of the violence and whether there was any giving way or locking symptom. Next one. So yeah, like your all orthopedic examination, you have to go with the loop fill, move and special test. Similarly, it is very true for your knee also. You look from your front, from your side, from your back. So you can appreciate. So I will categorically go one by one quickly. Next one. Also, this is very important as you examine your spine and knee, your gait is also very important because you have to, uh, whether the patient is able to walk or not walking is possible. Uh, if there is a stiff knee, there will be leg swing or other sometimes you might be fi finding some uh, painful gait or lurching gait uh, to, uh, to the normal side. Next one. And also you see the alignment from the front and also from the back. Also you examine uh, the knee, whether there is any gross deformity like your, whether is it normally aligned or there is a varus or valgus deformity. And whenever you are examining your knee, also you see the thigh also you see the leg and also you examine from the back side also to see and examine from the front your foot and the heel next so if there is any effusion also you have to see carefully that sometimes there might be gross effusion and uh, uh, gross swelling when there will be finding the horse to separate swelling is like your effusion then sometimes if there is acute probably you don't get these acute cases your or the pyarthrosis you don't get in your exam but if there is any effusion, you please do mention. And sometimes you might find some sort of fullness around the parapatellar region if there is uh, the ligament, the, the, the patellar tendon, because there is minimal finding, there, there will be some fullness around or just beside your patellar tendon. Next. Then you have to feel 
uh, also you have to look for the wasting and when you see the wasting sometimes this is asked in your exam what to measure and what to see your wasting always remember it is uh, not any fixed point from the patella where you find clinically or by your look where is the maximum wasting or where there is a maximum garth is there on the normal side there you there you take the measurement it's not like 7 to 10 cm from the top of the patella every time next one So movement, as you measure like your hip, uh, hip, you have to mention like your active, active and the passive range. And also you have to mention the limitation, the crepitation and the pop-up pop, pop sign or the, how the patella is going and the, whether it is painful, yes or no. Next. Then if there is a palpable click, you have to understand whether this is because of the osteoarthritis like your crepitus or a slipping tendon sometimes there might be slipping tendon, the IT band might be slipping or the semitendinosus or the biceps and loose body sometimes the patient can experience, he will be taken or even from the history, you can know that there is, if there is occasional uh, locking or the painful locking is there in the middle-aged people, then you might know that there is a loose body. Next one. So movement as I think uh, you have to know the normal, normal range and also the Flexion, the normal flexion is the cup uh, touching the thigh. Extension is uh, sometimes you have to see some zero degree whether it is coming, yes or no. Some people, they are ligamentous laxity. They are going into hyperextension. Always see the elbow, uh, your, uh, your the finger, and so that you can have the Python score. Never uh, forget that if the, the knee is going into hyperextension, don't forget to check for the ligament, generalized ligamentous laxity. Okay, if there is some... Um, also, you have to take the range, uh, always mention, because if there is any locking or any sort of synovitis or any crepitus, you also mention, you can feel during the movement. Next one. So anterior knee examination, you have to see the patellar grind test. Remember, this is a very important one because knee is flexed to 10 degree, glide the patella distally and firmly compress the patella against the trochlear groove then only you, you can understand because if there is a young or adolescent guy, sometimes you, because of the uh, OCD, osteochondral defect, you might find that the patella grind test is positive. Next one. So patellofemoral joint also, you have to see whether you can evert the patella because sometimes if there is, you can evert because the patella laxity or the habitual dislocation or the recurrent dislocation, that you can understand from the history. So you have to see and evert how much the patella can be everted and how much is patella is going uh, medially and laterally. Sometimes you have to check for the apprehension test because if the guy is having habitual or the recurrent dislocation, then there will be apprehension when you try to push the patella to the lateral side. Next one. And also during the movement, suppose you just hang the patient, uh, ask the patient to hang the limb from the side of the, your couch and see the patellar movement. Now this is the J sign. I will request you read it because uh, you can get the recurrent dislocation or the habitual dislocation. You will find the patella goes in a manner from extension to flexion. It will it will not go in a straight line. It will go from a straight line. Then you go to the lateral side. So this is the classic J sign for the patella. That you have to read and you might get this case because these are not very painful knees and if the case is there you'll be definitely get it next one so measurement also i am not going to detail because this you can read from your theory books and always uh, remember how to measure the q angle q angle is not a radiological angle it is always a clinical angle remember this is always a clinical angle next So Q angle, you have to see uh, the patient standing and uh, you have to see the from the anterior iliac spine to the middle of the patella, then to the middle of the, your uh, your ankle. And then you think for the male, it is 10, for the woman, it is 50. Remember these um, uh, degrees for your, because it, it may, might be, you might be asked for. Next one. And also measure, measure the, uh, if there is gross deformity, varus or valgus, I think you all know, how to measure the intermalleolar distance or the intercondylar uh, distance in the knee if there is a varus deformity. If you get that, please do measure because if you don't 
mention them, then it is a gross mistake. Next one. Now come to the special test. I think this is the most important part that we have to understand. Okay, so if there, always remember this side very carefully. When the, whenever there is a collateral ligament injury, there is a varus and valgus stress test, and the AP laxity sub is for the cruciates. So IDK that means your uh, the internal derangement of the knee because of the meniscus or for the loose body it might be. Next one. So meniscal examination, always remember if the examiner will ask you which is the most sensitive test, always remember that last time also I stressed it, that joint line tenderness is the most sensitive test for your meniscal injury, not your back Murray or the apple grind test. Next one. So stability, you have to check for the collaterals like the MCL and LCL, then the ACL and PCL. Always remember, uh, that when you check the varus or valgus test test, you have to check in zero and 30 degree. Why? In zero degree, suppose you take the your valgus test test and zero for the MCL. When you test at zero, basically you check the posterior, post, uh, your posterior structures, POL you check. But if you flex this to 30 degree, then you check the MCL. The examiner will classically ask you whether to check the MCL in zero and 30. Always remember MCL is checked at 30 degree, or 15 degree flexion, not at zero. And you once you test the valgus at zero degree, usually you check the your the posterior oblique ligament. If your posterior structures are checked, the same is true for your when you check for the your varus, varus test for your LCL. LCL is checked in 15 to 30 degree of flexion. When you extend at zero, then you check your posterior lateral corners. Next. <laughs> And also, the, this is a classic varus or valgus test at 0 and uh, 30 degrees. So this is the way you check both the posterior medial structures, posterior lateral structures. Always remember the posterior medial and posterior lateral structure that checked at 0 and the MCL and LCL is checked at 30 degree of flexion. Remember this one. Next. Next. So also, yeah, I will uh, tell you that you read the how to check the MacMorris because unless we are demonstrating this clinically, it is very difficult to explain. But remember, for the medial medial meniscus, you have to externally rotate, and for the lateral meniscus, you have to internally rotate. And from the flexion, you gradually come to extension, and at which point you the patient asks for the pain or there is a click then you know that there is a meniscal injury. So for medial meniscus, you have to externally rotate the foot. For a lateral meniscus, you have to internally rotate the foot. And this is the classic test because I think you will be definitely, if you get a knee case, you will be most of the time you will get an ACL. They will ask for the four prerequisites for the ACL, the Andrea Doyat test, okay? One, remember one by one. One is the 45 degree flexion of the knee, then 90 degree flexion of the uh, 45 degree flexion of the hip, 90 degree flexion of the knee. Then the foot has to be fixed. You see that the, the examiner is sitting on the foot. It is it should be planted on the couch, and you have to see the hamstring is relaxed. So these four points you have to remember for your this is the prerequisite for the anterior dryer test. Okay. Then you check. Like this way, the four, I, I, I think the last PG class also, we have uh, explained all the clinical tests with the uh, volunteers over there. So remember uh, that the, these four prerequisites for your ACL. Next one. And also you can, you have to understand what is a Lachman test because this is Lachman is done for the acute knee. For the chronic knee, you do the, knee the, do the either the pivot shift or the, your anterior dryer. Okay, Lachman, why you do? Because sometimes, because you cannot flex the knee to 90 degree on acute knees. That way, that's why you do the Lachman. Also, how, why, why you flex the, then the examiner will ask you, why you flex to 30, 15 to 30 degree? This is because of the door stopper effect of the meniscus. Because if you don't uh, flex to 15 to 30 degree, the meniscal will, meniscus will prevent the anterior shift of the tibia. That's why we have to flex the knee to 15 to 30 degree of flexion. Then re remember that you have to keep the your left hand on the top of the uh, patella and the other thumb will feel the anterior glide of the tibia so that you can ap appreciate 
how much tibia is coming in front. If it is coming more than 5 mm, 6 mm, then is a positive test both for the anterior doyer or the lateral. Next one. Then you have to uh, uh, understand how the pivot shift is done because this is the classic test. They will ask you to show. Sometimes this is painful, so you don't test. Many a times you just check, ask the patient, always explain, always explain what test you are going to do because the examiner will uh, see how you are doing. It is not the actual test. Always remember in, in orthopedics, whatever test you are doing, you first explain to the patient, then they ask the examiner that I will sir, do it on the normal side, then come to the abnormal side. Don't jump, just if you they ask you, so the pivot shift, don't jump and do it. Always follow the protocol, explain the test, then do on the normal side, uh, show the patient in the confidence, then you come to the uh, abnormal side. Probably the examiner will not uh, tell you, okay, okay. Uh, if you tell them, tell this to the examiner, they will, okay, no, now you explain. But if you don't tell, they will catch you. Next one. So pivot shift. Remember that there are three components. Why it is known as pivot shift, I told you. Just go back to the higher, yes. The pivot is the MCL. So if the MCL is torn, you cannot do the pivot shift. Because from the middle midpoint, it has shifted to the MCL, medial side. That is, that's why if the ACL is gone, now the pivot is shifted to the MCL. So there are few things that you have to remember. One is the valgus to the knee, internal rotation of the leg. Then you from the flexion, you go to extension. Because why you do this? Because in 30 degree of flexion, the IT band becomes the extensor. So once you give the valgus force internal rotation, now the TBI is subluxated. Now once you go to the extension, the IT band will relocate the tibia to the normal position. So you will feel the third, you will feel the click and also the patient will feel that the now is relocated. Now the patient will also feel it. Next one. ECL also you have to see clinically that sag sign, classic sag sign. You have to see whenever, you have to see from the side. So, uh, from You have to go to the side of the patient then you see whether the TBI is gone back. Next one. So this is the classic sac side. Can you see that the TBI, if you compare, then always remember that you have to see from the side, not from the top. Because once you go to the side, then only you see that you know, compared from the normal side that this TBI has gone back if in comparison to the other side. This is the classic sac sign. Next one. Now this is known as the Godfrey test. It's the same side, same thing, only because if you flex the hip to 90 degree, knee to the 90 degree, and then you just hold the heels. And if you see from the side, because of the gravity, the tibia will go back. So this is also a sex sign, and this is known as the Godfrey test. Next one. So now you see the same thing. This was the uh, same thing. You can see the, the uh, the TBI has gone back. This is the classic signal, the sac sign for the PCL. Next one. And all this, this is very important. Please listen to carefully. This is the dial test. The dial test is done for the PCL and the PLC. Always remember that this can be done in both supine and prone, but usually if you, uh, if you are asked to do it, Tell the examiner that this, sir, this can be done in both in supine and prone, but the, most of the examiner, they will love to see in prone position. So what you do in this dial test, you just flex the knee gradually to 30 degree, then you externally rotate the foot and see the position of the foot. Now suppose the, this is done in supine, if you see the, the right side, it is more externally rotated if you than the right than the left side. So in 30 degree, if the, there is more external rotation, that means 15 degree more external rotation in comparison to the normal side, then you know that this is a PLC injury. So in 30 degree flexion, if there is external rotation more than 15 degree, this is PLC injury. And in 90 degree, if the external rotation is more, then it is a PCL injury. But if from 30 degree to 90 degree, it becomes more, then this is a combination of PLC and PCL injury. So remember, 
in 30 degree, if the external dosage is more and it is not increasing in 90, then it is a PLC. If there is no external dosage in 30 degree, but there is external dosage 90, then there, there is a PCL injury. If there is more external dosage in 30, at which increases at 90, then it is a combination of PLC and PCL injury. Okay, next one. So, the, the, so if there is a difference of 30 degree, as I told you, remember in 30 degree, it is PLC. 90 degree, it is PCL. And if it is increased in both, then it is PCL and PLC. Next one. External dosage recarbation test also sometimes you have to do. It just read from the Campbell. It is beautifully written over there. Just you have to hold the great toe and see that the tibia goes into hyperextension and external dosage. This is the classic signal or the sign or test for the, your PL stage. Next one. And also the reverse pivot shift, I will tell you this is not been ask the examination, but if, if you read it properly um, uh, for the river, river, river seed, I think next time whenever we get scope to uh, show you clinically because it is hard to explain, but dynamically access for the post, this is all, again, this is for the posterior mm -hmm. lateral B, uh, rotational injury. Next one. Yeah, finish, sir. I, so I think, I think more, the most important part that you remember for your clinical test that you don't forget that the Q angle is a clinical angle. It is not the radiological angle. The joint line tenderness is the most sensitive for your meniscal injury. The, uh, your varus and valgus, both you have to test in zero and 30, 30 degree. So that in zero, you will be testing the posterior medial or posterior lateral structure. When you flex to 30 degree, then you test the classically the LCL and MCL. Then uh, entry at the, I could tell, told you the four prerequisites. In Lachman, why you flex to 15 degree to avoid the door stop or effect of the meniscus. For the PCL, you remember the sac sign, Godfrey sign, and also the posterior dry test. Okay. And for your dial test, I have told you in 30 degree for PLC, 90 degree for the PCL. If the both are increased in 30 and 90, this is a combination of PLC and PCL. And the for patella, you remember, you see the how the patella is tracking and the J sign you test and the apprehension test. You don't forget. Always remember to test the patella grind test because if the adolescent guy is there, then you might miss the osteochondral defect, uh, the OCD or the osteochondral defect. So I think this is the, because me, you will be definitely getting for the only short case. So if you are through with this test only, I think it is more than enough. If anything is uh, to be added, I think Obishek is there, Sohom is there. If anything is added, you can just remind me. Thank you very much for your kind and patient hearing. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. It was a pretty elaborate uh, explanation and a pretty uh, excellent uh, presentation on the knee. So actually, uh, the thing is that as knee is mostly a short case, which we get on in the DNB and the MS exams, sir, uh, I have uh, uh, like... Uh, Yes. So taken the uh, so taken the opportunity to make a list of some of the common cases which we were taught in our postgraduate days and that. So if you can just mention one or two points in the like in brief because you have explained most of the things in detail in your uh, uh, this thing lecture. Uh, sir, uh, first one is uh, like when we get a uh, say a uh, genu valgum or barum case. So, sir, in that case, one, some something which you would like to add, like which the students make a common mistake when when yeah. you have examined yeah. the. I, yeah, I think I have also during the lecture I have told you how to see the genuvirus and valgum because you have to check from the front and back, and yeah. also you have to um, see the foot because in genuvalgum it might you might miss the flat foot, and also sometimes you might miss the heel valgus. So examiner will catch you, whether you have examined the foot or whether you have seen the, seen the arch of the foot. And also whenever you see uh, the, your genu valgal, always uh, tell them that whether there is any, they, uh, if you have examined the hip, yes or no. And also whenever you me measure this, the intermalleolar distance or the intercondylar distance, you mark the malleoli, you mark the medial side of the knee, 
so that you you your, your marks would be there on the patient so that you remember that the examiner will ask you about the, these distances right sir and so the uh, so the next case which i would like to mention is uh, uh, so quadriceps contracture what to see in the knee or what the sir like rather yeah. what is the common mistakes which you have seen in your uh, long and illustrious uh, uh, the career as an yes, examiner yes. sir yes, because because it from the history also you can see the why that there is a quadriceps because in nowadays it is not that common because in our time the, the, there was injection in the thigh so that's why sometimes the quadriceps contraction is there classically you are not getting the quadriceps contract contracture because of the injection but because of the post traumatic nowadays we are or the post op cases you can find the for the extensor mechanism contraction okay so remember that you have to take the history properly see for the scar and now the, if there is a quadriceps contracture always see there, there are two components what is the intra articular component another was the extra articular component so remember that you have to check the mobility of the patella whenever you see this sort of contracture in the extensor mechanism see the how much is the mobility if the mobility of the patella mm -hmm. is not there you certainly know that you have to tell the examiner that this is the intra articular component is there then you have to check in the prone position also how much we, uh, because you have to check for the rectus you know the over test and all this test you have to for the rectus also you have to check the whether in the prone position you can check the rectus is tight or also your lateral the it band is tight that all your test has to be done for the quadriceps but don't forget to check the history of the trauma any scar on the back side which might be hidden in the garments that you have to check in the up side and also check for the remember that the knee stiffness is always of two component one the extra articular and the intra articular check the mobility of the patella always examine whether there is any rectus component is there and also on the other side your it band contracture is there okay nice right, sir and uh, so one more uh, like uh, i suppose a very common short case with the uh, students encounter uh, sir the uh, tb knee like the triple deformity sir any specific points or rather any common mistakes which the students make while presenting a case of tb knee tb knee in our time it was there very common but nowadays we are really yeah, rarely finding it's not very rarely common finding, it's not it's very, not very common. remember that this is a classic triple deformity i yes, think sir. We, yes. we, we absolutely yes sir it is a classic triple deformity the history is very uh, very significant and the most important part the, remember the examiner will ask you the wasting you will never find this much of wasting in any of the diseases like your tb knee so there will be gross wasting around the thigh muscles most of it, it is like a skin and bone sort of thing okay and there will be the knees probably in 80 to 90 degree of flexion okay so there will be classic wasting and also there will be triple deformity of your knee absolutely and sir uh, sir uh, uh, sir a few points about uh, sir the uh, bursitis pre prepatellar bursitis intrapatellar bursitis and you can add uh, uh, sir the uh, popliteal cyst a few points though these are again very rare cases which are given in the exam because they don't no no i think, I think they, they can they might get the they might get the uh, your becker cyst or the yes. uh, the the, uh, the popliteal cyst because they will be asked only one for the pertinent question that remember that in becker cyst in extensal it will be there but if you flex it it disappears but in semi membranous cyst it will be same both in flexion and extension another one point that you would remember that it is the bicuspid cyst is a midline one and the semi membranous cyst there is the medial ones so from the location also you have to identify because they will ask you this pertinent question how to differentiate from the bicuspid cyst from the semi membranous cyst okay so if the Uh, swelling disappears in flexion. It is the Becker cyst. If it is the size is same, then it is a semi membranous cyst. Becker cyst is the midline one. Semi membranous cyst is the medial one. So these are two things that if you answer, the examiner will be happy. And another one is the the, the you ask about the prepatellar or the uh, your uh, the uh, your housemate Intra and all this. I think uh, we have all heard intrapatellar ones. so this I, i think your classic location will tell you the if it is in front of the patella or if it is in front of the tbl tuberosity 
then you understand that that it is a classic one because this is post traumatic might be or most of the time that create in your house mates or the tibial ones is because of the chronic uh, friction on the uh, in kneeling position okay and also there will be some callosity in the front okay sir and uh, sir last but not the least a little bit something about uh, sir the uh, tumor around the knee joint like what we get class classically we will be mostly discussing osteochondroma tomorrow in the uh, pediatric uh, session a little bit around what tumors and what are the things or what are the little bit of like guidance regarding the tumors around the knee joint and what again the common mistake i think i uh, deliberately just not touch the tumors once because this is a big topic to see but we mm -hmm. we'll remember The, the classic thing that you have to follow: look, feel, move, measure. So, look, what there will be? There will be shiny skin. If there is venous prominence and there is wasting, venous prominence is a very important thing. If you see the tumors, okay. The, if you this aggressive ones, but for the osteochondroma, you will not find this venous prominence or the shiny skin unless it is a big one. Okay. Then for the tumor, how, how you see, the skin is also very important. sometimes the age is very important because in the age group you know in the uh, age is very important because by, by that way you can uh, more or less uh, understand which group of tumor probably you are facing to then in the tumor in the knee tumor benign ones is the most of the time you will be getting the osteochondroma in the adolescent group okay and if you get an osteochondroma around the knee i will request all the examinees that don't forget to see at least uh, just run through your examination from the your uh, both the arms see the back for the, your any pigmentation any uh, neurofibroma or because you this, you know that this is the classic combination of your uh, the oleous disease or the multiple mafuchi 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 syndrome yeah mafuchi so remember the examiner even if it's, it is a very rare one probably it yeah. is not there but the examiner will be happy that you have examined and the back You have seen for the pigmentation. You have seen the arms. If you because if you miss any extra the uh, uh, osteo uh, exostosis on the arm or the scapula, then they will catch you. So remember, you might miss in the scapula or else you can in the arm. And the classic tumors probably you might be getting either the giant cell tumor or the your osteosarcomas. Okay, but as because the, these are painful, uh, we usually don't put this in the exam case even if it is put there we don't allow the examinee to do lot of test because this is really painful for the patient so if there is shiny skin uh, the your venous prominence uh, the wasting is there age is uh, matching then probably you might uh, take that this might be a tumor case okay no okay. okay sir so i think that, that should cover our knee examination and the common cases that we uh, that the student space in the exam sir uh, any any other think, comments i think about if, if, if the examinees they have attended the uh, the last pg course uh, if they are there so we have explained every every single test with the volunteers over there so i think that was a great one and if you have, that has been already been recorded i think if you can go through that you will be definitely finding all those things because uh, me and dr devagoto banerji were there at the knee faculty we explained every test with over there and i think you go to the ward and just tell tell your uh, seniors to uh, just check for this common test whatever i have told today this is the common test you do, should not miss on this ones so these are the common test that is asked for you don't ask for okay. the the the, uh, the hyper extension valve your rotation test you have to see the four requisites of the acl sac sign godfrey sign posterior dryer uh, the your 0 degree 30 degree of MCL, patellar mobility, patellar grind, and the J sign and varus and valgus of the knee. See, if you don't, you just this is a common Q angle. So these are the common things they are asked. Never the examiner is going to ask you very very high five things in your exam examination. Right, over sir. To, thank you. Yeah, over to Shom. Yeah, I think uh, we're done with the last session. So I think we'll call it a day. and i i'd like to thank all our national and state faculty shonanda shamanta sir fantastic presentation so i know basically this is a pg crash course so i everything has been taught in detail in the pg course so this is just a small revision for everyone i hope this was 
uh, you know very helpful uh, it was very helpful for me because i learned many new things and revised a lot of old things as well so yeah i think thank you sir i think we'll uh, just take everyone's leave and we'll join thank tomorrow you. at 6 yes thank you everybody and best of luck to to all the examinees uh, tomorrow tomorrow i am not there so uh, i think that tomorrow also you will have to definitely have a great class for the for the examiner thank you right. very much for right. giving me the opportunity thank you sir thank you sir thank sir. You. sir sir it was a pleasure listening you. to you sir. thank you okay i think we'll end the session yeah sure and uh, anyone else uh, in the like among the participants like the presenters or anyone want to be make any comments or make any associated uh, like you know any points which they want to raise or what they want in the program for tomorrow if any 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 issue or any uh, special thing which they uh, want to mention because tomorrow yeah because tomorrow our session will be on uh, this thing pediatric orthopedics and we will be having a session on elbow and shoulder examination followed by our instruments mri yes, and yes, mri is etc etc which will be like the smaller and the i suppose the less hectic uh, part of the exam i suppose and then, right yeah. right so yeah yeah i think i think okay sure okay okay just one thing you know yes yes sir yes sir yes sir please yeah please please sir we are waiting for you uh, good evening yes sir Just Good evening, am, sir. Yes, uh, nice to hear all these things. One thing I would like ask: all the participants should make some questions that will make uh, more fruitful. I hope so. I would request all the participants to put forward their doubts so that that if we discuss, that will be better. Okay, that is the only thing I would like. Thank you. Right, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. We'll note it. Good night. Good night. uh so um should we like uh, ask uh, uh, our any other like the students who have logged in sh should we ask them to give a talk or something like that or just you know just mention about the program what like uh, what they wanted or any they have any doubts they can always yeah, yeah, you they know can, they, can, they can always text us they can text uh, yeah. if, uh, on the official youtube channel they can comment there they can comment this is not thank you obishek and so okay. we have done excellent thank job you. and thank you thank you and there we have heard this uh, good lectures and also compilation of the good uh, the thank you sir thank you for the favor of points in favor of the diagnosis okay. so we have um, in a quick review what are the different cases and how lot of the points in paper you have discussed everything but it is the it is it is the uh, part from the students so to clear the doubt so student must uh, as i am also agreeing with dr vera um, the student should ask the questions what absolutely are absolutely we need act, more active participation from the students <laughs> so is there any doubt then otherwise we can end the session yeah otherwise, i think we can end the session for tonight absolutely in absolute thank you sir sir okay looking forward to sir so uh, listening to you tomorrow sir. thank you so i think you can end the session i think we will again again uh, this thing resume resume tomorrow at 